the prophecy will always come true. Narcissus is a beautiful, self-loving jerk who can't stop looking at himself. A lonely man suddenly understands what all the fuss is about. I'm sorry that people are so jealous of me, but I can't help it that I'm popular. It's not my fault you're like in love with me or something. Everyone would love him and then hate him and curse. Don't see the beauty in yourself. Oh, watch out for the flowers! We are the illusions and the alkaloids. We, we are the reflection. Noble-hearted nymph Echo used to have a body in a complete speaking capacity. The gods are all dicks. Narcissus fought off the nymph, but she fell deeper in love with him. Never trust a perfect fountain. His body transformed into the Narcissus flower upon his funeral pyre. Well, Echo mourned him. Save lives, but not with your voice. Echo, Echo Candid, Echo Margarita, Echo Montesco, Echo Ramata, Echo Uniformis, Echo Sometimes, Echo Maxima, Maxima, Maxima. Ooh-ah, 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 ooh-ah. Sounds. Dear, Dear sounds. Love. Whoosh. Love. Whoosh. 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 Synth noise. Synth noise. A set of instructions. Is anyone really there? Zoom me out of here. Dear God, why? A catalog of faces. Matt Placuja Jadnuja Technology. Click, click, click. Kirk Creer. Kirk. A reflection of the self and the not self. You are the reflection. It's art, but live for you, by you, and in front of you. Watching, judging, and enjoying. Ones to whom I show my vulnerabilities. Mirror, a reflective surface. It can show you more than you wanted to see. Me. The watchers, watchers are watching. The listeners are listening. The watchers are watching. The watchers are listening. The watchers are watching. The listeners are listening. Little yellow birds which grow from the dirt. Ancient and moldering, with a full-bodied aroma on flagstone. The National Flower of Wales. Trumpet-shaped corona. The good kind. Taxonomic reigning over la primavera foliage. Flora, forma, reveal your scapos. I think daffodils are nicer. A beautiful...
Poison. Ingestion is followed by salivation, acute abdominal pains, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, then trembling, convulsions, paralysis. Death may result if large quantities are consumed. However, looking at them, I still want to eat them. Finally, he shouted, Enjoy my body! You enjoy my body! Scorned, humiliated, and shamed. Ah, oh, la 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 la! Dee da! Dee da! Rum! There, Narcissus wastes near Sir Rock and Miss Lilypad. Pardon me, sir. I seem to recall you being proud of this. Daffodil, your inability to see my beauty disgusts me to my core, and I will throttle you with my spindly fronds. Trash cat, riff raff, we don't buy your modernism. Class, what I have for you today is show and tell. Goal one, remember to always smile. Note, it's subjective, a time-tested recipe. Goal two, be sure to bear my teeth. I wretch at the use of light. Bounding through. Drawing attention. Can't to look away. The train wreck seems to keep moving. Together, together. <laughs> together. Apart. 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 Together. Apart. Together. Together. Apart. You need to want to hear it. Repeat the most recently spoken words. Whisper in reply. One, block all the social media. Two, erase all traces of them from my head. Three, proceed with business as usual. Some say duck quacks don't echo, but they're wrong. The CH is pronounced like the J in jalapeno. By fear, the truth. By madness, God himself. Goal three. Set a trap. Build a fire. Roast the fiend. Enjoy the feast. Remember to brush my teeth. We are oh, the reflections. reflections. We are oh, the illusions and the alphabets. Rag, 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 Hello, and welcome to Fierce Comfort Theater, presented by the 33rd Annual Manhattan Experimental Theater Workshop. My name is Gwethelyn Williams, and it has been my honor to be the director of this summer's workshop. So since this is a workshop, we like to do things like just come on out and talk to the audience and tell you a little bit about what it is that you're seeing. So that's what I'm here to do. And we're really glad you've joined us. We're really excited to share with you the amazing work that this year's company has created. So thank you very much for being here. So since we are virtual again this year and we're coming to you as a YouTube premiere, let me uh, get a couple technical things out of the way. So we do encourage you to use the chat if you would like to. It's a wonderful way to sort of 
feel like you're uh, sharing the experience with other people, if you share your reactions to the show as it's happening and that kind of thing. And it's a great way to give some support and feedback to the performers as well, since they're also watching and will probably be participating in the chat some as well. So we encourage that. However, if the chat distracts you, you can turn it off at any time and just enjoy the show. The show will run about 90 minutes. We do not have any kind of planned intermission or break, but since it's a YouTube premiere, if you need to step away from your screen for any reason, you can just hit pause. And when you come back, you can start playing the video again from exactly where it was when you hit pause, or you can scrub forward to uh, anything that has played since you left. Um, the way the premiere works is that you won't be able to jump forward past um, the broadcast of the premiere and where it is in the video, but you can uh, join at any point from when you hit pause to where the current broadcast is. Also, we will be doing a live talk back after the show. So that'll be a YouTube live stream. So you'll have to go to another link. Uh, that link appears in the description beneath this video. It also appears on our program page, which I'll tell you more about in a second. So we hope you'll join us for that live talk back. We'll have some of the cast members, some of the directing team, and we would love to answer any questions you have about anything specific you see in tonight's performance or general questions about the workshop itself or the, the way that we worked this summer, the virtual process. Um, we, we'd just love to answer any questions that you have. So that's another wonderful way to sort of give some feedback to the performers. So hopefully we'll see a lot of you at that live talk back. So I mentioned the digital program. Uh, that's just basically a part of our webpage that has all of the information of everybody who helped make this year's workshop possible. It has more information about the playwrights whose techniques we've been emulating in the show tonight and uh, all of our wonderful sponsors and donors who we appreciate very deeply are all listed on that program. So I do encourage you to go to the show page, take a look, um, learn more about all of the wonderful artists who helped create this year's show and everyone who supported us. And there is a link to that show page as well in the description uh, under this video, or you can find it on our website. Let's see, I think that's all the technical stuff out of the way. So uh, let me explain to you a little bit more about what it is that you're gonna see here tonight. Uh, working in the virtual meeting, it's very exciting. We, we can sort of have a much larger crowd of people from all over the country, all over the world. And uh, we're really happy to have you here with us. And that's made possible by this uh, wonderful virtual medium that we have to work in. So, but our process remains the same. So what you're gonna see in the show tonight uh, was created in, the, in the, the way we've always done the work in the workshop. And so for the first two weeks, the company members met and began studying examples of experimental theater and talking about what the techniques in those examples were and how they worked and how they communicated with the audience. And during those two weeks, we also played a lot of games uh, did a lot of exercises, vocal training, physical training. And this year, since we're in this um, interesting new medium, we also experimented a lot with sort of what could be done in terms of video techniques and um, this, just this strange medium of virtual theater. It, it was a true experiment. This is extremely experimental <laughs> what we're doing. Uh, we learned a lot last summer, but um, there's so much more to learn and every Every discovery is a delight. So uh, we really had a lot of fun in those first two weeks, not only getting to know what we could do together as an ensemble, but learning about what was possible in this medium of virtual theater. At the end of those first two weeks, the participants make some decisions. So the first decision they make all together is they choose what we call the target story. So the target story is gonna be a story uh, that is one that most of our audience will be familiar with, uh, a part of our shared culture. Uh, so this summer, the group chose the Greek myth of Echo and Narcissus. And if you're a little rusty on your Greek mythology or you've never known the story of Echo and Narcissus, uh, we will actually present to you a, a summary of that myth um, to help you understand what it is you're seeing here tonight and how the different experimental theater techniques are working along with that story. Uh, so at that time, they also let us know which of the playwrights and techniques that we have studied in the first two weeks they are interested in trying out themselves as they continue on and write their own new plays. So we put them into groups based on uh, the techniques that they're interested in. And then each group writes a new play that is 
based on the target story. So tonight you'll see every piece is based on a retelling of or inspired by the myth of Echo and Narcissus and uses the techniques of one of the playwrights or theater makers that we studied in those first two weeks. So then after they've made those decisions, they have four weeks. And in those four weeks, they wrote their brand new plays, started with nothing, <laughs> ended up with some beautiful scripts. Then they needed to make decisions about how those uh, scripts would be presented in the virtual medium, how they would look, how they would sound, how they wanted to perform. Uh, they had those four weeks to make all those decisions and rehearse their performances up until it was time to record. So we worked very hard. They worked very hard and got them along as far as they could in the amount of time that we had and then uh, recorded their work. And that's what we're going to share with you here tonight. So obviously this workshop is a lot of work and it takes a lot of people to make it happen. Uh, so I want to thank some of those people now right off the bat. Uh, so uh, of course I have a wonderful directing team, a group of assistant directors who help with all of the directing duties and uh, help the participants through the process of, the, of creating their pieces. And this summer that is Isaac Sorrell, Megan Clark, Jim Hamilton, and Lauren Fisher. And I'm mentioning their names now because you're going to see or hear some of them later because uh, they'll come out and tell you a little bit about each individual piece before, uh, before you see it. So thank you very much to the directing team. You guys have been a joy to work with and have worked so hard this summer. Thank you. I also want to especially thank our tech crew. Uh, this, this is much more complicated in terms of technology. Uh, they started their work months before we began, helping us figure out what some solutions could be for how we could do things, how we can work together. Um, and, uh, and then of course, helped us record and then took all of the footage and made it into this amazing show that you're going to see tonight. So their work there, it cannot be um, overpraised <laughs> the amount of work that they have done. So thank you very much to our fabulous tech crew, Ash Flynn and Brandon Sargent. I want to give a special shout out to Jim Hamilton. Uh, Jim developed the process of this workshop himself over the first 15 years of the workshop and uh, he directed for 15 years and basically this workshop would not exist without him and all the work he put into it and uh, I know that anyone who has ever uh, had the pleasure of being in the workshop really really deeply appreciates that so thank you Jim. Uh, when Jim retired after being director or producer of the workshop for 30 years Lauren Fisher took over as producer. So I want to give a special thank you to Lauren. She works very hard and does so much in support of this workshop. Thank you. Thank you to our producer, Lauren. Let's see. Um, all right. So you guys have already seen the first piece. Uh, we just threw you right, right in there, right in the deep end uh, with a piece using the techniques of the Dadaists. So that first piece you saw was written by the entire company together. It was called Illusions and Alkaloids and used the techniques of the Dadaists. And I'm not going to take the time to tell you about the Dadaists right now. I think you might have uh, gleaned some stuff from that piece. Uh, but if you want to know more, please check out that digital program. So uh, what we're going to do next is present that summary I told you about of Echo and Narcissus. So I do want to let you know that the myth itself, uh, we do have a content warning for it. If you're interested in the specifics of that warning, you can take a look at that warning as it appears on the screen now. I do want to let you know, however, if any of those things could potentially be a problem for you, that none of those particular events in the myth are directly recreated in any of the pieces you will see. They are indirectly referenced. Then, of course, the, the pieces deal with, um, with situations that happen within the context of a story that includes those things, but they will not be uh, graphically or directly represented in any of the pieces tonight. So. Uh, after the summary, you're going to see Megan Clark. Uh, it's going to appear to tell you about that first uh, small group piece that you're going to see. Uh, but in the meantime, I hope you will enjoy this summary of the myth of Echo and Narcissus as narrated by Jim Hamilton. As with many ancient myths, there are multiple versions of both Echo and Narcissus's stories. The first and most widely known version is Ovid's Metamorphoses. Echo was the most talkative of the nymphs. 
when Hera came looking for her husband Zeus, who was busy having dalliances with Echo's sisters. Echo would greet Hera and distract her with lengthy conversations. When Hera discovered what Echo had been doing, she cursed Echo to speak only a repetition of the last words spoken to her. When Echo sees Narcissus hunting, she falls in love with him and follows him through the woods. Narcissus senses her presence and calls out to whoever is following him to show themselves. But of course, Echo cannot say anything but the last words Narcissus says. Finally, she reveals herself to him and moves to embrace him, but he is horrified and flees from her. Echo spends the rest of her life hiding in deep woods and caves, her sadness at his rejection consuming her until eventually she withers away. Her bones turn to shapes of stone and all that remains is her voice. We still hear her repeating our words in caves and woods today. In another version, Echo is the daughter of a nymph and a human. She learns to dance from the nymphs and sing from the muses. Echo scorns all advances from man and gods. However, Pan desires her, and when she refuses him, Pan causes the shepherds and goatherds to chase her down in a frenzy and rip her into pieces, which they scatter and fling across the land. Because of Echo's beauty and virtue, Earth accepts and hides Echo's remains so that her gift for music and song can continue to be heard as echoes forever. Liriope was raped by a river god and bore his son, Narcissus. Liriope consults the blind seer Tiresias, who prophesies that Narcissus would live a long life, quote, so long as he ne never discovers himself, close quote. Liriope raises Narcissus in isolation and he becomes filled with pride and selfishness. When he goes out into the world, everyone he meets falls in love with his beauty and desires him. But Narcissus scorns the advances of his suitors, remaining aloof. One suitor, Amaonias, is particularly insistent and stubborn. When Narcissus sends him a gift of a sword, Amaonias turns the blade on himself killing himself on Narcissus's doorstep while calling on Nemesis, the god of revenge, to curse him. Nemesis causes Narcissus to find a fountain where he can see his reflection perfectly. Narcissus falls in love with his reflection and attempts to kiss and embrace it, but it disappears when he touches the water. Narcissus demands to know if there has ever been a more sorry soul than a man in love with himself. Eventually, Narcissus wastes away, but left in his place are Narcissus flowers, which we now call daffodils. Chiori Miyagawa's play Awakening is itself an adaptation of The Awakening by Kate Chopin. Characters that never inhabited the same time or place can share the stage. The connections of their stories are made clear by the collapsing of time and distance. Scenes are repeated as their events again become significant. Dialogue is sparse and minimalist. Everything unnecessary passes unseen and unsaid. She incorporates songs, music, and movement to communicate ideas without and beyond spoken words. In the play you're about to see, it is happening now, the story of Echo and Narcissus is retold using these techniques. Why try to catch a fleeting image? A fleeting image. When it is I, Narcissus, who I perceive. An echo of a reflected 
form? I felt, I searched for, I gazed at. Perhaps we'll meet again. Alas, in vain, my beloved. Seer, I seek an answer. My child, will he live long? I want to know. Can I change his fate if it is unfortunate? Make it better if it is fruitful? Fate cannot be changed, Loriope. You may see what is in store for your child, but you cannot change fate. But will he live long? If he ever knows himself, he shall perish. You hid your sisters behind your tongue and betrayed me. I curse your tongue to only repeat the last you hear. They speak in fragments, together or not at all. How many tales your tongue would tell while my Zeus's lovers bid farewell? They return my gaze as I meet theirs, their beauty reflected in my eyes, and yet, your mouth a door, your words upon the tip of the tongue forevermore. Their sighs I sighed, their groans I groaned, their farewell. Farewell. Is anyone here? Is anyone here? Is anyone here? Is anyone here? Here. Is anyone here? Here. Come to me. To me. Who is the one speaking to me? Me. Hello. Hello. Who goes there? There. Come out of hiding. Please, let us meet. Let us meet. When are you going? Not too soon. Already? I'll go when you go. I know. We are only kept apart by a little water. He looks like he is trying to reach his lips to mine, like he desires to be held. He could be touched, but vanishes. But I am he. I sense it, and I'm not deceived by my own image. I am burning with love for myself, and I figure he feels the same. The same. I move and bear the flames. What shall I do? Surely not court and be courted. Why court then? What I want, I have. My riches make me poor. Oh, I wish I could leave my own body. Strange prayer for a lover. A lover. Now sadness takes away my strength. Not much time is left for me to live. Nor is dying painful to me. Laying down my sadness and death. I wish that him I love might live on, but now we shall die united. Two in one spirit. One spirit. It is happening to me now. Now. When you're not here, my imagination runs wild. Something a little bit more than human. I fall more deeply into that myth. I wish to forget. We must go somewhere when we die. Our energy must go somewhere. Does it radiate into space, get absorbed into dirt, eaten by worms? Death and love and decomposing leaves. I'm good at blindly tunneling onward. To be enfolded by the warm earth. That is where my energy will travel next. Turn it into earthworms, my body turned to dirt. An ecosystem in itself. Let the grass embrace my limbs. 
Let the rain kiss my forehead. You were so tired there, exhausted to be forgotten, hard to keep going. Let my body become a part of this landscape. You became rocks on the hillside. Let me be done crying, done dancing for you, done pitying you, sacrificing for you, praising you, done calling your name, done loving you. You became powerful. You embraced death, reverberated throughout the mountains. It is happening to me now, 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 now. They return my gaze as I meet theirs. Their beauty reflect in my eyes. And yet... And yet... They speak in fragments, together... Together... Or not at all. They stay and must stay, and swim away at a moment's notice. Their perfection escapes my notice, my moment... Moment! Passes me by. By. Sometimes I wonder why. I wonder. Why do people say true love is staring you in the eyes? Must one wait so long for nothing? Though, that is the overall theme of desire, is it not? As the saying goes, You don't know what you've got till it's gone. It is happening to me now. Is anyone here? Here! Is anyone here? Here! Come to me. To me! Who is the one speaking to me? Me! Hello? Hello! Who goes there? There. Come out of hiding, please. Let us meet. Let us meet! When are you going? Not too soon. Already? I'll go when you go. I know. It's, it's I who stares back at me. It is my own reflection who I yearn for. I stood, you stood. I waved, you waved. It was as if we'd known each other all our lives. When are you going? Already? I'll go when you go.
My desires mirrored in front of me, year after year, mercilessly trapped on either side for all to see without beginning nor end. I am never to meet, ever yearning. Ever yearning. It comes and stays with you. It comes and stays with you. It's a feeling of unmatched fervor. Two discordant tones ringing for millennia to come. Longing to be united at last. Why try to catch a fleeting image? At last, what I searched for, what I perceived, what I felt, what I gazed at. Please, perhaps we'll meet again. A millennium away, Publius Ovidius Naso paired a previously unknown nymph to a definitive story of Narcissus. My role was too familiar. A missed connection. It's happening to me now. It's happening to me now. A missed connection. I'll go when you go. I know. Samuel Beckett's later minimalist plays explore memory, repetition, language, inevitability, and death. His plays contain sparse, precise actions contrasted against an unstoppable stream of stark but elegant language. Characters in Beckett's plays are unable to stop speaking, but they are also unable to fully express themselves through speech. The highly calculated stage action and the unceasing words heard combine to create a flow for the piece that makes the meaning of the play just as evident in its structure as in its dialogue. In the next piece you are about to see, In the Air, the fragmented memory of a disembodied echo repeats ceaselessly in her attempt to understand her own fate. Do you remember? Nymph Cleo did the most kind thing by reading your astrological map, right after seeing you try to approach Hera once more around the cursed lake. Of course she feels guilty, because she was one of the nymphs that was making out with Zeus that day, went talking to the goddess, thought it was a nice gesture. She told you your Mercury's in Gemini, your sun in Gemini, and your moon in... That's right. Pisces. Moon in Pisces, which is very doubtful since you had never fallen in love before, for neither man nor god, woman or goddess, and Cleo said that the nymphs with Moon in Pisces are the most honeydews and deluded. The truth is that it was barely impossible to live with Narcissus's rejection. But don't think about that stinky, most handsome, ridiculous boy anymore. Oh, protecting your beloved ones shouldn't have cost you this much. Maybe her moon is in Scorpio in the house of Scorpio? Only that would explain such jealousy. Do you think she can't help it like those sociopaths? This is Zeus's fault. Because he was having fun? No, because he is always hiding his fun from her. She shouldn't feel rejected for the nymphs, thinking, why, why, why did you help them hide? You knew the worst thing could happen to them, but then again you ended up being the one to whom the worst happened. To protect a god. No, to protect your friends. Okay. What exactly did you tell her? Blah, blah, blah. Not important. You wanted to distract her. She answered. Your tongue with which you tricked me. Now its power shall lose. Your voice avail but for the briefest use. You froze. You froze. You froze. Then tried to begin a song. Then tried to begin a song. Then tried to begin a song.
Couldn't hear it there. Couldn't hear it there. Couldn't hear it there. It's there. It there. It there. 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 In the air. In the air. In the air. 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 Do you remember before when you danced in the fields with your sisters? When you sang beautiful songs? When you were overly talkative, chattering on about anything to anyone who would listen. When you were a child and you believed there was only good in the world and the worlds beyond. Remember when you filled the air with your voice? When the flowers sang their songs back to you? When you could talk to a wall and be entertained? When you let it all ring true in the open skies? Remember how you used to dance and sing and be happy with others in conversation? until you dropped to the ground from sheer overuse of your body and voice? Remember where you slept safe with your family with no worry? Where you entertained, where you danced, where you sang and kept people company? Do you remember before where you would write stories to share? Where you would share those stories, where you would keep them safe with your secrets? To be unable to control one's voice is no easy life. First, talking too much, never able to filter. And in the moments of silence, telling the mistakes you've made. One would think that the silence would be a joy after that. But it's just as bad. Being silent. Out of control. Unable to speak without a prior word and unable to say new words. What is the point in it if there's no control in the language? There is no speech for you. No freedom. To be trapped in your own head thinking all the things you wish you could say and it's impossible even with others speaking first. Train of thought doesn't matter. What's the point if the silence is just as imprisoning as the speech? Metaphorical prison becomes physical prison. Of your own accord. Why would you choose silence after the hurt it brought you? Was the hurt from speaking really worth losing what little you had left? That boy. That beautiful boy. He didn't speak to anyone else either. Why would you be any different? If only you had known before, but it's too late now. Trapped in your metaphorical, physical prison with no bars but the still cords in your throat. What happened to your song and dance? Your voice got you in trouble. If you can't use your voice, it can't hurt you again. Just lock yourself away and no one can hurt you. Even yourself. More alone now than you were when you pushed people away with your voice. Metaphorical prison now stuck in your head, only repeating, unable to speak without one speaking first, and unable to speak new words of your own accord. You're so desperate for conversation that you yell back without realizing, 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 without realizing. Remember when you would sit with others and you would talk for hours? No interruptions but those of a slipping train of thought. Now you can't share those thoughts alone to the walls of a cave. No one here to help you speak and stretch your voice and keep it strong. Instead, it fades to a whisper. That beautiful boy. You can't see him disintegrating into a pile of ash, rebuilt to a beautiful flower. He sent you here. It's his fault. Why does he get to be beautiful and you're a lump of stone in a cave? All alone. By yourself. In silence. He could have saved you if he had spoken longer. Beautiful boy. Staring in a pond. You could have joined him and said in silence. Even that would be better than sitting in this cave alone. Unable to speak. Losing your power to move. What happened to your song and dance? In this cave? You could have made something beautiful out of your prison, if only you had done more when you were out of it. Still like stone, like your bones now. How long has it been? How long since you lost yourself in your silence? Since you made your silence? Take what you have and throw it away. Become part of the cave. You had freedom and you threw it away over a boy. It was always out of your control. You talked too much, then not enough. Never enough. Always too much. You could have been not enough. Instead, you chose nothing at all. Remember when she confronted you and told you? Your tongue with which you tricked me 
now its power shall lose. Your voice avail but for the briefest use. Did it help her feel better about herself? Her abuse in her relationship with her husband? Did it solve her problems and anxieties? Silenced forever, except for the unoriginal thoughts of others. Do you ever wonder what others think about? Do you hope she will think of you as her husband brings home more of your sisters? Will she think of you when she hears them laughing and singing? Will she hear you in the plucking of strings, in the howling of the wind through the trees? Will she hear you in your voice when she goes to sleep in her dreams, when you are yelling out, Why? Why have you hexed me? And she wakes up in a cold sweat and cannot fall back asleep for thought of you and your voice that she stole. You shouldn't have done it. That day. That day when you went to visit Zeus. And you should have known. Should have known she'd show up. They sent you out of the room to meet her, to distract her with your words, and the words you had. Use it to have at least. And you talked. You were too bold and too loud, and look where it got you. Why did you tell her, oh, I'm just here? You had it too good, too good. And you threw it all away over some man. Why can't you let these thoughts go? Why can't you whisper them to a friend or scream them out into the night? Because you talked too much. Do you think you could try? Maybe you just haven't found the right words to say that let this whole thing disappear. Do you remember when you agreed to that task? Do you remember how you realized what you had done? How you wept? How you screamed? How you made any noise you could? How you fought desperately to be heard again? How you fell to the ground in resignation when it hit you? How you lost control again, 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 lost control again. Do you remember warmth and kindness, empathy and love? Or has your heart gone cold as your bones? Remember how it feels to be loved? To be listened to? To be heard? To be something worthy of people's time? Or are those feelings numb to you now? Are you so lost in your loneliness those memories are long-forgotten relics, unfamiliar and cold to you? One white daffodil left in his place. He saw daffodils for himself. You saw roses for him. Lavender roses. Love at first sight. Lavender. Not the flower, the color. You saw lavender roses growing around him. He seemed to be unaware of you. Red roses sprinkled your thoughts as you went on. Flowers don't grow in caves. You don't see flowers growing. Unless he's there. Maybe he could make flowers grow in a cave. He flooded your thoughts like a riverbank after a storm. Everything you saw was all him, all lavender, red, white, twisted. Yellow-tinged vision as you stiffened. Daffodil next to the pond. White, new beginnings. How about that? Beginning new as a flower, stone, voice. Lavender, red, white, turned yellow, crimson. Morning. Crimson, red tears fall down. Hit the ground as you weep into your arms. The only sound you can seem to make on your own. Or the only one you've tried. It's impossible to laugh anymore. To sing. Tears falling is easy. It's easy to cry when you've lost everything you ever had. Why can't a flower grow in a cave? Flowers grow by ponds, away from stone. Would he grow a flower in a cave? You can't. You don't deserve it, surrounded by stone. There's no poetic language to stone. Feelings die in rock, not like flowers by the pond. When you sang your song that morning, so pure, did you know? Did you know it would bring such terror and violence? The pumping of hot blood flushing your face as you tried to get away? The gnashing and howling of men, like dogs or wolves, their sour breath down your neck? The forest, still covered in morning dew, glistening in the sun as its rays cast a gentle glow, where you used to dance and sing with your sisters, a chorus of voices attracting the god of the wild, your companion. Where is he now, you wonder, as the tugging and scratching grows stronger? 
the roaring of beasts in your ears, and you scream in agony as they tear into your flesh. Sinews snap and bones crunch until you've vanished. All vanished. Not a sound. Only the wind howling and your faint song still reverberating in the clearing as your sisters come to mend you up, bandage your limbs, tend to your bruises. Hold you close, 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 hold you close. Playwright Harry Condolian's play, The Brides, which we read and studied in this summer's workshop, is a carefully constructed progression of short scenes written in lyric, narrative, or monologue form. Condolian explores the myths and fairy tales that we create out of our own dreams and desires, and the dynamics of passion and relationships. In The Never Loveds, this group explores the stories of Echo, Narcissus, and Emeonius through the lens of their own dreams, disasters, and perceptions, and maybe a little bit about what role our own obsessions might play in the continuing appeal of such tragic stories. Please enjoy The Never Loveds. There was a time. And because every heart is broken in this tale. We will jump from desperate middles to frayed beginnings. To imagined endings again and again. There was a time. The protagonists speak. My story is odd. So many stories all about me, yet not. I loved myself. One found me, followed me, repeating what I said back, never giving an answer. Another loved me. I sent him a sword. Then I came to the lake. I was cursed to fall in love with myself. There I stayed, day in and day out. I withered away. The nymphs came and found a flower instead of a body. The Narcissus flower, the daffodil. My story is odd. I was an eloquent conversationalist, cursed by Juno, condemned to repeat the last words of others. I chanced upon the most beautiful being and fell madly in love, but I spent my remaining days pining for his words in lonely exile. Now I am but a whisper on the wind. My story is odd. I had a happy youth, then I fell in love with a handsome boy, and all was lost. I pursued and beseeched my love to return my affection. My love awarded me a sword. 
I wish I turn on myself. Ballad of the Never Loveds. Legend has it, there is a league of unloved, of never lovers, each believing their love will win the heart of the prized beauty, Narcissus. And who plays this losing game? I do, my dear friend. And so some say do you. But the game is rigged, I'm afraid. And we have rigged it. Pity us. For we are all forsaken. Love him. For he is the truest beauty. Loathe him. For he is but a monster. Why is Narcissus so beautiful? Because you painted him that way. Narcissus is the glowing moon, reflecting back the light. But you are the sun that warms his cold surface. Narcissus is doomed, and you wrote the prophecy. You and I, us, we are the pool in which he sees his reflection. You pity us, but you are us, and we wrote this story. Another one bites the dust. Darling Narcissus. Please. 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 Be. 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 Mine. Mine. Be the golden hour light that makes everyone more beautiful. Be the incessant jingle of the ice cream truck every night, all summer long. Be my mirror and my magic wand. There was a time when a beautiful boy, Narcissus, wandered out from the tall reeds into a beautiful clearing. He had managed to escape his trusty entourage of dopey hangers-on, when lo, there in the distance, a stranger. Was he a friend? Unlikely. Or a foe? A threat? Most men are. Or a godsend? My gods, the stranger whispered. Never before have I seen such beauty. I must know him. I must have him. I must. He could already picture their new life together, getting married under the Tuscan sun. What ho? shouted Narcissus. Are you friend or foe? Oh, fair boy, I cannot spend another moment without you. You sound like every other person I have ever met said Narcissus. But you are very handsome and seem kind of sweet, and I might be interested in making your acquaintance. The stranger took a deep breath, drawing in the strong scent of daffodils, and demurred, I am a Mayanias of Vespus, and I would die for you. But for the time being, would you like to take a ride on my horse? And with that, Narcissus swung himself up onto Emeonius' steed, holding on to Emeonius' waist. Later, as he returned home, Emeonius hoped to find a profession of love, but instead was greeted with the gift of a gilded sword, masculine, majestic, accompanied by a note. Dearest Emeonius, hope you like the sword. No, said Emeonius. No, 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 no! If you don't love me, then you sure as hell don't get to love anyone else! And with that, he took out his new sword with the intention of slaying some of the other Neverloveds, but tripped on the steps and slayed himself instead. The next day, Narcissus was greeted by a cloud of damselflies flitting about in the cooling blood of his new friend. Oh no, Narcissus groaned. Not again. Dear Zeus in Olympus, or Jupiter in Olympos, please help me fall in love so that I can get all these creeps off my back. Narcissus waits for a response. Nothing happens. Damselflies buzz. The wind rustles in the reeds. 
the scent of iron wafts on the breeze. What happens when the gods are not listening? We turn to the seer. The seer speaks. Oh, a baby of foam and bubbles. Almost fairer than Aphrodite, but not quite. Don't let her know that I said that. Look at me draining away your time. Let me hold the little boy, Liriope, a hidden pearl. You may have been forced into a tumble of salty tears to find this pearl, but you have it in your hands now. I understand the weight it has on you. I can see how his story affects your present. Not to worry. All is now until it becomes after. But cheer up, I have a little gift for you. For all your patience and endurance, you will be rewarded, Liriope. Good girls like you deserve some comeuppance. Now, what do you say to a quick consultation of the future? Now, let's see here. Foam and bubbles, as I said, ensnared in a net of perpetual drowning. Father by waves, mother by shore, son of mirrored ripples. He was born to lie on a surface. He will be all you wish him to be, if only he finds something in that shell of a body to discover why he is. One can't swim forever. Echo, echo. There was a time, and because this is an infinity loop of tales, we become lost on the endless path of possibilities. And because we are social creatures craving the company of others. There was a time. Echo, a nymph, obsessed with Narcissus, a hunter, although she had no words of her own, followed him through the woods. Narcissus took home the nymph and made a cozy place for them both beside the reflecting pool. Tra la 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 la. There was a time. And because there is no meaning to be discerned beyond the constant crashing waves. You know you will be found out. And your admirers will see you for who you really are. They demand too much, and you won't be able to live up to it. In the walls of this castle, you are shielded from the grabbing and the clawing, the dirty hands and the stinking breath. Scorn your lovers. There are no morals here. Oh, where am I? Said the pretense of the hunter. This play is not about me at all. All the characters are consumed with fantasies of success, power, brilliance, beauty, the perfect mate. A quiet place to rest and reflect is what one truly seeks. This is the part of the story where my feelings of undying love and unbridled jealousy are so overwhelming that I want to die. But I don't want to die because I want to be able to keep telling you this infinite loop of tales tomorrow and the next day and the day after that and to your neighbors and friends and their friends and their neighbors. But with every movement, flames engulf me. I wish to leave my own body. Perhaps the only solution is to tell the ending. But then, if we follow our impulses, there, there will, will be, be no, no infinite loop, loop of tales. tales. There, there will, will be no lovers, no, no adoring, adoring fans. They, they would be left searching endlessly. For a meaning to their little lives, waiting hopelessly for a hero to arrive. Mass communication. Trust, 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 trust. That our love for you is sufficient. Show some interest in others. 
return affection that is given to you. You can't avoid us all forever. Bring us flowers and chocolates. Eat the 3,000 cookies we made for you. Tell us you love our mixed tapes. Don't ignore phone calls and texts. Ghosting is unacceptable. Waiting. In times past, the words flowed like a babbling brook. Now she lies alone in her agony, quiet, contemplative. Her fate a broken record, caught on the last words of others. Much does she have to say. All will go untold. He imagined a future for them. Their happily ever after. Long hunts together, cooking their kill side by side. Nestling under the light of the stars, they were perfect for each other. He did not want him in the end. The sword will be his demise. They hold in their hearts a love so strong it might rip them to pieces. I will scream! I will wither! Only his words will penetrate the thin mountain air. Reflecting back to him. What does the daffodil say? Sometimes, alone in the field at night, crickets chirping, wind rustling the leaves, moon glowing silver on my temples and corona, I remember my life before. In my house, each mirror was warped. Too tall, too short, too fat, too thin. All the waters were dyed with herbs. No clear reflection, not one. I must be beautiful because everyone tells me I am beautiful. But what I saw when I looked in the mirror was ever-changing, too hard, too soft, a mystery. I must be special because everyone tells me I am special. But you know, no one ever wanted to just like get a snow cone and play stickball. Everyone wanted to kiss my cheeks and swoon and sigh. And it was all so boring and lonely and dumb. Some say I had a friend once, but all I remember is blood. When I finally saw my face in that clear silver pool, I thought, this is it. This is love. I am free. Now I am more than enough. I am everywhere in each hill and dale, in glass vases on countertops atop birthday cakes, in wedding bouquets. This quiet life doesn't hurt so much. This quiet life is a gift. This is it. Reflections reverberate, sound and image. If only they had found each other sooner. When we are finally exhausted by this constant chatter, all will be revealed through photo ops and sound bites. The hills are alive with the sound of voices and spring bouquets. And gilded swords have gone out of fashion for this season, but mirrors appear to be in vogue. Those seeking sage advice best be prepared to pay top dollar or live with their bargain basement predictions. Some things stay the same. A new flower is discovered, and it's called a daffodil. They live they on, live on, live on forever. forever. So many endings, but where is the one we deserve? The ghost of Echo meets the ghost of Emeonias, and with a wing, a sword, and a prayer, a whisper, they are wed in a field of daffodils and herd goats to this day. Narcissus, knowing full well that he will go down in history as the one true schmuck, throws an impromptu self-wedding and turns happily into the bouquet. The Seer, again. Good day to you all, but I'm not really sure if anyone's actually out there. I'm blind, you see. It's incredibly difficult for me most days. 
seeing everyone's future while unable to see them in the flesh can get to you sometimes. A long time ago, there was a beautiful young man who learned of his beauty, and there was a lovely young maiden who angered a goddess, and there was a young man who received a deadly gift. None of them found happiness. Love your friends, love your neighbor, and then may you love yourself. Love is not a sin. Just make sure to always use a condom, drink lots of water, just don't look into the glass. Hello, I'm back. I've got some more people to thank and some reminders for you and then the information on our final piece. We do have one more piece for you tonight, but first a few people I need to thank. So first of all, I want to thank you, our audience members. We know that we demand a lot of our audiences and we make you work pretty hard. So we really appreciate the fact that you're willing to do a little work with us here this evening in order to uh, see the work that has been done this summer. So thank you so much for your support. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. We really appreciate it and we're really happy to have you. I'd also like to extend a special greeting and thank you to all of the alums of the program who have tuned in tonight. Um, this program is truly a collaborative process and it has truly um, changed over the years. So anyone who has ever been a member of the workshop or has gone through this process has really contributed to what it has become today. So we thank you all for the fact that you chose to spend some of your time and energy in the workshop. And we want to thank you and say hello to you and greet you and extend our appreciation for everything that you have done. Thank you so much alums for joining us. And we hope maybe we'll get to actually see you in person one of these days soon. Um, I need to definitely thank all of our sponsors and individual donors. So we have a few high level sponsors that they were credited at the beginning of the show and you can find a list of all of them in our show program that's linked in the description. We also have a lot of very generous uh, individual donors who give uh, donations of all kinds of amounts and we really could not do this workshop without all of those donations. Uh, it is really what keeps us going. So we appreciate very deeply all of our sponsors and all of our individual donors. Thank you so much. And I hope that you have appreciated uh, getting to see the work that you have supported. Uh, and then I will just mention that if you would like to become a donor uh, for MXTW or for any program of the Manhattan Arts Center or the Arts Center itself, you can find a link to donate in the description under this video or on our program page, I believe if you scroll all the way down to the bottom. So uh, if you would like to make sure that this workshop continues in the future, uh, we would love for you to support us in that way. And thank you very much for considering it. Uh, speaking of the Manhattan Arts Center, it's a really incredible place. It's a wonderful resource for all kinds of arts to the Manhattan, Kansas community. And we are so appreciative of being one of their programs and that we live in a community with such a great art center. And we want to thank very much all the staff of the art center. We may not have been together physically, but they certainly did a great deal to support the workshop this summer and we couldn't do without them. So thank you so much to all of you Manhattan Art Center staff for all your help and everything you did to uh, make this workshop possible this summer. I cannot uh, thank enough our tech crew, so I'm going to thank them again, even though I thanked them at the beginning of the show. Um, Ash Flynn and Brandon Sargent, you are incredible, <laughs> and the amount of effort that you put towards making this show happen was really astounding. And all, every single one of us who worked on the show deeply appreciates all the work that you did. Thank you so much to our wonderful tech team. And then uh, the last thank you that I want to extend is, is one that comes specifically with this virtual medium. I want to thank all the performers. Of course, I want to thank you for your efforts and sharing your wonderful creativity with each other and making such wonderful pieces. But I also want to thank you for allowing us to have a workshop in your home. 
When you decide to participate in this workshop, you also opened up your home to us. All of our workshop sessions took place in your homes. And uh, now you have shared your homes as well with the audience since a lot of the footage was recorded there. And uh, so I just wanna thank you all for being brave and generous and sharing that space and time with all the rest of us. So thank you very much, performers. Um, and then along with that thank you comes another important thank you, which I want to extend. Hopefully some of these people are watching tonight. Uh, to anybody who cohabitates with one of our workshop participants or staff who have spent the last month uh, being real weird in front of our computers and, and doing all kinds of crazy stuff, um, we really, really appreciate your consideration and uh, we know that in some ways we probably inconvenienced you by holding this workshop in your home. So we want to thank you for your support. This wouldn't have been possible without it. So thank you to all the roommates and families and cohabitators, uh, anybody who <laughs> shared space with our workshop this summer. We really, really do appreciate it. Um, I want to remind you that there will be a talk back following the show. And uh, at the end of the show, that you, there'll be a reminder and the, there's, the link is in the description below the video or on the show page on our website. And so you can join us there and um, ask any questions you have about what you've seen here tonight and we will be happy to answer them for you live. So I hope to see a lot of you there. All right, and now I will introduce the last piece. We've come to the end of the evening, but we have one more treat for you. This last piece uses the techniques of choreographer Pina Bausch and she was a pioneer in the dance theater genre. Bausch created her works based on movements inspired by real life rather than traditional dance or traditional dance steps. She created her pieces by asking her dancers questions and then her dancers would respond using movement. And then Pina would take all of that material that her dancers had given her and piece it together in ways that felt right. So this, the company this year uh, came up with some questions inspired by Echo and Narcissus, and they presented answers to those questions and then pieced those, that material together into the piece you're about to see. All the questions were inspired by Echo and Narcissus. They included questions such as, how do you feel? When you're rejected, what do you want but you cannot have? How do you curse someone? How do you turn into a flower? How does water make you feel? So those and some other questions that were inspired by the myth of Echo and Narcissus were all uh, put together to create the piece you're about to see. So I hope you will enjoy Fierce Comfort, a piece inspired by Pina Bausch.
So everybody, make a shape. And bow. And when you come up from your bow, make a different shape. <laughs> that was great. That was fantastic. Okay. You